In August 2017, two kayakers travelling down the Red River would make a chilling discovery. They'd noticed a suspicious object caught on a log in the water, and upon further investigation, they would find it was the body of a young woman. This discovery was, unfortunately, only the latest instalment of a gruesome story that would shake North Dakota to its core. Savannah Lafontaine Greywind had much to look forward to in 2017. She had just gotten a job as a nursing assistant, where she was hoping to later go on to specialise in elder care, but was moving in with her boyfriend of seven years, and they were expecting their first child. But for the moment, she was living with her family, her parents and her brother in their basement apartment in Fargo, North Dakota. This might have been a difficult time for some people, but not for Savannah. She loved her family, she loved spending time with them, and she would keep in constant contact with them throughout her day, through calls and text messages even though they all lived under the same roof. That was also why her family knew where she had gone on August 17th, 2017. They had been a bit surprised to find out that Savannah had agreed to help their upstairs neighbour, Brooke Cruz, but not because of Savannah. Savannah was a kind and caring person who often went out of her way to help others, but the family were a little concerned over who she was going to help this time. Brooke Cruz, who was 38 at the time and Savannah was only 22, had lived above Savannah and her family for a long time, but the family only really knew her in passing. If they had known about her past, they would have known that she already had seven children, all of them with different partners and none of them or the children actually lived with her. But it was her relationship with her current partner that would shape so much of Brooke's reputation. William Hohen and Brooke were getting into explosive and violent fights, Altercations that were so bad, Savannah and her family could hear them through the ceiling, which would actually shake from all the noise. But it was after one particularly bad fight that things would get serious. William was arrested for assault when he admitted to throwing Brooke into the bathtub, and he would be issued a no-contact order by the court. Just six months later, William would be in trouble with the law again, when the police, responding to a disturbance report, found him in the apartment again, and he was charged with violating that same order. And this would not be the first time that either of them had been in trouble with the law, or even the court, for that matter. Both Brooke and William had lengthy track records with the justice system, and Brooke would be taken to court several times to be sued for not paying her child support. But Savannah had wanted to help Brooke. She'd refused to go upstairs with her a few weeks before that day on August 19th, when Brooke asked if she'd wanted to go upstairs and smoke some weed. But this time, Brooke was asking if Savannah would be a model for a dress Brooke was making, and Savannah said yes. Savannah was home alone during the day. By this time, she was eight months pregnant and was finding it difficult to go to work in the heat and with her swollen feet and the other joys of pregnancy. But she was in constant contact with her family. 
She had even ordered a pizza for them to enjoy together for lunch, but it hadn't arrived in time for her to have any before she had to go upstairs and meet Brooke for their appointment. When Savannah's family came home, they would find that the pizza was still untouched on the countertop, Savannah's car outside and her purse and her keys inside the apartment. Her family were already a little concerned. Savannah hadn't replied to any of their other messages throughout the day and they hadn't heard back from her since she'd sent them texts to say she was on her way to Brooks. Another thing was that Savannah was supposed to drive her brother to work that day, something that she wouldn't have missed or would have at least let them know if she wasn't feeling up for it, so he could figure out another way to get there on time. But nobody had heard anything from her. Savannah had left for Brooke's apartment at around 20 past one that afternoon and by four o'clock her mother Norberta was really worried. She went upstairs and knocked on Brooke's door but Brooke told Norberta that Savannah had left around quarter to three and she had no idea where she was. Norberta knew that her daughter wouldn't have just wandered off, not without telling them and not without taking her car, as she couldn't walk very far because of her swollen feet. And Norberta was starting to get suspicious. Brooke was the last person who had any contact with Savannah and now no one could reach her. Almost immediately after talking with Brooke, Norberta called the police to report her daughter missing and officers arrived at the apartment building just after 5pm. Police would search Brooke's apartment twice that day and once the day after, but they found nothing of significance. A deputy chief at the department later coming out and saying there was nothing to suggest any criminal activity in Savannah's disappearance. But Savannah's case was already in the media and a reporter investigating Savannah and the apartment building she lived in would receive an anonymous anonymous tip that said that a sex offender was living in the same apartment that Brooke was. He would go over to the apartment to investigate the tip, but when he approached the door, all he heard was the sound of a machine. He said that it sounded almost like a vacuum cleaner, but it was too loud to be a normal domestic one, but it was instead maybe something from a construction site or something industrial. The tip would prove false, but what he heard that night would later tie in with so much of Savannah's story. Brooke and William were the only suspects in Savannah's case, but police didn't make a breakthrough until they spoke with some of William's colleagues. William worked at a roofing company and his colleagues reported him talking about the newborn baby that he had at home. This was disturbing to investigators as they had not seen or found any signs of a baby while searching the home and it was enough for them to get another search warrant for the property. This time when they went into the apartment they found a healthy baby girl lying on the bed and they arrested Brooke and William. Brooke would only speak once with the police, telling them that when Savannah had come over to her apartment that afternoon, Brooke had shown her how to intentionally break her water, and Savannah had actually delivered her baby there in Brooke's apartment. She then went on to say that Savannah had given the baby to her afterwards, and that was why Brooke had her. But this story, and the DNA tests that proved that the little baby girl was Savannah's, would only open more questions. How could Brooke and William have the baby, but not know where Savannah was? And where had she been all this time? 
all would become clear when the two kayakers found Savannah's body in the Red River on August 27th, 2017. Her body had been wrapped in plastic and duct tape. She had strangulation marks around her neck and her womb had been sliced open. Shortly after arriving at Brooke's apartment that day, the two women had gotten into an altercation, an argument that led to Brooke pushing Savannah whilst they were in the bathroom and Savannah had fallen and hit her head. Brooke then raced to the kitchen where she grabbed a knife and cut Savannah's unborn baby out of her stomach. Brooke didn't know if Savannah could feel anything at this point. She was drifting in and out of consciousness, maybe from the head wound, maybe from blood loss. But she did not know if Savannah was alive when William returned home and found them in the bathroom. Brooke then turned to him and held up the baby, saying the words, quote, This is our baby, and this is our family. Brooke had done this because earlier that year she'd told William that she was pregnant in an attempt to get him to stay in the relationship. When William had found out that she had been lying, he'd told her to, quote, come up with a baby or else. And Savannah had been Brooke's solution. When William walked in on Savannah and Brooke, he'd jumped into action, and not in the way I think any of us would have hoped. He asked her if Savannah was dead, and when Brooke couldn't give him an answer, he ran for a rope, tying it around her neck and pulling it. Eventually, he said that if she hadn't been dead before, then she was now. The two would quickly clean up the scene, stuffing Savannah's body into a closet in their bathroom where it would remain throughout all three of the police searches and was never found. William had laid in bed, keeping the newborn with him under the covers while the police searched the apartment and eventually they came up with a plan to dispose of Savannah's body. They hollowed out a dresser, put her body inside it and then dumped it in the Red River where it was discovered just six days later. Brooke would later testify that William hadn't known about her plan to kill Savannah and had only helped her afterwards. She also testified that William had strangled Savannah, but this was later disputed when one of Brooke's fellow inmates came forward to testify that Brooke had admitted to her that she had been the one to strangle Savannah. Whether this was true or not, Brooke was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole and William pled guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping and lying to the police and was eventually sentenced to 20 years in prison. Savannah's boyfriend, Ashton, gained custody of their daughter, naming her what the couple had decided to name her before Savannah's murder, Hazley Jo. She'll turn five years old in August of 2022, and Ashton has made great efforts to keep her involved and raise her within the Spirit Lake tribe, to which he and Savannah belonged. And her death was a spark that would go on to create a change in how Indigenous cases are handled. A bill named after Savannah Greywind was passed in 2021 that will allow Native Americans and tribal communities better access to federal crime information, as well as creating a standardised protocol for how the police and other investigative forces should handle missing and murdered Native American women and their cases in an effort to prevent this from happening again and to help crack down on the high number of missing Indigenous women cases across the nation.